just want to quickly introduce, we have Sina, Reinhold, and Muriel. Um, when we tried to organize this event, we didn't want it to be too pharma-centric. Um, Unfortunately, we have Novartis, Roche, and Roche <laughs> as well. We also have Kirill to balance I'm it no out. But we also <laughs> represent um, Switzerland as well with Lausanne, Basel, and uh, Zurich as well. Um, just to sort of kick this off, and again, this is a question around like the past, the present, and the future, and maybe I just um, pose this to Kirill first, is... How do you think our community has evolved over the past five years? Um, what are the, your kind of personal highlights and where do you see that our community going in the future? And I know you've kind of touched on a lot of these topics before, but do you, is there anything specific that's a personal highlight to you? So uh, a personal highlight, especially combining past, present, and future maybe, is the focus on data frames as the basic data structure and so if you can make it to Chicago this fall to the PositConf, I will be speaking about how we can bring in uh, data frame operations, do them at high speed with no limits on memory and using all the cores by combining it with uh, DuckDB. So I think DuckDB and Arrow will help uh, Mm -hmm. Even bringing the the other um, ecosystems we, we have that we want to integrate with R without sacrificing performance. So that's that's what I'm excited about. That's I think where a part of the journey will go to. Mm -hmm. So data frames. I mean, I'm happy to discuss why I think this is where we should focus on especially when it comes to nested data frames. So I'm not talking about 1,000 columns wide. I'm talking about data frames where you can put stuff into cells. Um, this is what Arrow can do. This is what DuckDB can do. And this is this, this common um, piece of infrastructure where you can connect all the other systems to Python, Julia, JavaScript, will speak Arrow and DuckDB and speak Arrow and DuckDB. So, so this, this will make all of this seamless and, and fast. So we, can, uh, we solve the, 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 the performance problem without yeah. having to move or, or consider moving the entire stack elsewhere. I think this is a really important point that it's not R versus different languages. It's almost like an interface. So that R can be the interface to different technologies. I think that's a really key point. Um, Rhino, could I then pose to you the same question? What are your kind of personal highlights in the past five years and where do you see our community in the future? Yeah, for me, it is interesting to have seen it now for more than 20 years. Because here in the pharma industry, as I started working here in Roche uh, many, many years ago, it was a statistics department, the whole biometrics department was in data management, even the databases at some point were all dominated by SAS. That was a given. If you work in pharma in the biometrics department, you had to know that. And if you don't, you had to learn it. And over time, it was fun to see past 20, 2000, how it got now less and less young statisticians coming from, particularly the ETH, brought some uh, other skills with it. We could uh, give them a little bit on the server, but it was just the beginning version uh, R0.83, if I remember. That wasn't too good. But over time, we could improve that. We got new servers, no more HPUX, and then we could offer that, and that gained traction. And now, yes, Roche prides themselves to try to do all the new stuff and stop the SAS development. So that is a major achievement in a way. Mm. Maybe we have to look out for the future. What will all this, um, <laughs> is it hype around machine learning, as a particular uh, language-based ones, mm. uh, chat, G uh, GBT, uh, uh, making bit wave, big waves. Maybe say something like um, causal development, as when you develop uh, machine learning models that try to aim to get out of data or you put something in of causality, of cause and effect, how will R um, perform there? Yeah. 
Exactly. Um, it's interesting, though. I guess when we talk about R, we're also talking about open source or open sciences, mm. where, and, and I guess there's this conflict where some of these large language models, mm -hmm. they're kind of the opposite of open, <laughs> where you don't know what the underlying data yes. is. We I do have a chat GPT question towards the end to um, close out, so I don't want to spoil this just yet. Um, let me move to another question, and please, at some point, I will open it up to the audience. So think about questions and comments as well. So this is really supposed to be a discussion. Um, maybe, um, Muriel, can you share any success stories from your perspective, um, particularly experiences of collaboration or any personal highlights from your side? Yes. Good morning, all. I can also give a reflection or um, the journey with R, and I would highlight the community since I'm very active in the community. I or co organized the Zurich R user group. It's exponentially also grown over the past <laughs> few years. So we're counting over 2,200 members mm -hmm. and have frequent um, meetups where we have presenters, and afterwards we meet over beer and just discuss from all different backgrounds. I think that's a highlight that the R community is really diverse. And um, one of the highlights that I can also share is um, co-organizing the Use R conference that was in 2021. So that was also a big achievement with like with the community for the community. It was the first Use R that was internationally by design. So also the the committee who organizes this was a global organization committee and then since it was only a virtual conference of course we tried to reach as many use R from all over the world yeah so these are my highlights to share thank you and Sina do you have any personal highlights from your side and it can be from either community perspective or from a working experience perspective? yeah I, I can say maybe two like one from more personal experience and one maybe from a, a community aspect I, I still remember when our studio first came along and that was for me it was like it was the best because it was well, we had to use at the university we had to use MATLAB and R and, and MATLAB had like a nice interface and it was a pain to use but uh, with data <laughs> but um, but R we had this kind of you know it was yeah it was so plain and you had to like operate all these windows and and then our studio came along I, and I think this was kind of a a turning point for me because I realized oh companies are interested in this and yeah so I'm, I'm very glad that that stayed and got because at the time then there were all of a sudden different UIs mm -hmm. and but our studio stayed mm. of course because it also had like the the, the finance bit uh, behind and then maybe from a community aspect I'm I'm really glad that the user groups stayed and and evolved and and I'm really glad that our ladies um, came around at some <laughs> point. Um, and it's still alive. And uh, yeah, all around the world that kind of this, not only our ladies, but kind of this community aspect that, that got, yeah, kind of what involves more diversity and so on. That, that was really nice, I think, to see and that this got traction and then also implemented in conferences as well. <laughs> In thinking about this side, the community is probably the most important part, particularly for open source, it has to have the community behind it. I, I just wonder maybe if to open up to the audience, does anyone have yeah, a comment? Can wait one second. Uh, to me, an elephant in the room is uh, a cultural clash of the open source world where everyone does everything for free mm -hmm. with pharma, where everything is incentive based by money and how the general user uh, uh, our community also perceives the the fear that there is a domination now of the R universe and an exploitation of their free will to spend time on support to R. and so in a way how 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 can we have a real fair um, community of incentive-based industry with open source. Does anyone want to take this up? <laughs> I can just yep. say that I, I, I resonate with this feeling and I can, um, I, I can just confirm that open source contribution is can be exhausting. <laughs> like it can lead to burnout like, because you, if you are a developer, you get so much feedback from users as well. It's really hard to keep up with um, 
like back fixes. Like I mm. gave up on it personally, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I like I, I just uh, cruise along like just with the our community, but I'm not doing development anymore. Um, mm. And but and I agree there should be some. I I think some companies they also like uh, for example um, your company they they actively give back they try to find the balance mm. in um, yeah giving back with open source projects as well yes yeah. I, I think pharmaverse is here to be mentioned mm -hmm. right <coughs> that's a whole set of packages co-developed between pharmaceutical companies and they are open sourced <laughs> <laughs> the point is really the R core yeah. and the people that mm -hmm. work in the background and on the uh, uh, and one of my best friends is part of that. So that community grows old. That's mm -hmm. the one problem. Mm -hmm. And to find new people to do that and to have this whole back uh, bone of things uh, uh, keep running. I think that's the, the major part where I'm concerned about fairness. And do you think, uh, I guess from, I mean, maybe speaking as a farmer um, representative, I don't like to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I guess there's a way to, financially, I, I guess these companies can provide support, but it's also resources as well. We have expertise within our, our company. You see this at Roche. Um, Novartis have people that contribute in an open source way. Would it be a mixture of financial incentives or um, actually putting people in place where they become a member of, say, the R core, or that they actually are es essentially employed to support our, the open source community. Uh, I'm just wondering how we could facilitate it, going back to our companies. I think that <laughs> 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 if, if money, um, then you potentially destroy the culture. Yeah. So I think it's work and not money. Yeah. Mm. No, I would agree. And communication, of course, <laughs> uh, uh, talking with the people that are involved. Yeah. Maybe Martin has uh, a point to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm one of these old R-Core members. <laughs> 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 the only one from Switzerland. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so very important questions you raised. And I think you're right. It's what, what would help is <coughs> donating collaboration time mm -hmm. this is really the issue mm -hmm. right giving people that you employ full time like a lot of their space to work with something that doesn't directly pay to your company and mm -hmm. this is very hard to get universities do that they have done this with me eth right in some sense yeah thank you mm -hmm. Any final yeah, so yes, I wonder why you would accept time, not accept money. Because, well, to some extent, these are interchangeable. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the point is, it is about collaboration and uh, it is about spending your time, your energy, your personality into the thing. And the idea that time and money would be interchangeable is the culture of the incentives and the culture of open source is the joy in just contributing without thinking on money. And you destroy that culture when you put in only money and not work. It's a very strong feeling uh, 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 culturally about whether or not these two things are interchangeable. And I think the, the psychological <laughs> thing behind it, look at those um, videos on children, very small ones, that have all the joy to support their parents when something goes wrong. But the very moment that they get a uh, gratification that they get something for it, the joy of contributing gets lost. That's the mechanism behind it on psychology. There's a lot of joy on contributing without getting gratification for it. And the moment you put in the gratification, the joy of contributing gets lost. But the gratification you get is 
status. You get something you can add to your CV. Mm -hmm. You get exposure, comes with status. Um, some just do it for the dopamine of, uh, I do, <laughs> of, of getting this notification. Oh, somebody wants something from me. That's the dopamine. That's the, me the, the mechanism I'm talking about when I talk about the children. Yeah. So dopamine is, is bad. <laughs> dopamine, <laughs> is, dopamine is good. Uh -huh. But money reduces the dopamine, and okay. that's the mechanism that I'm fearing. Maybe just to broaden this out, and I, I'm going to go back to Muriel. So, how does this is more or less the same lines? How does the community contribute to the development and improvement of our? And what are the different ways people can get involved? And hopefully, it doesn't need to be through a company. It could be just through um, spending time volunteering. But Muriel, do you have any ideas or thoughts on this? <laughs> the ideas I have is like what Sina said that to some extent there's also if you're not getting or only receiving dopamine for what you contribute <laughs> to the community it's also difficult and you at one stage you come to an end where it's no longer feasible to keep giving and not receiving back so somehow I think it's a mix of where we need to go like yeah <laughs> it's a difficult um, question and um, so contributing to the community I think you can do it in big ways you being a core R member but you can also do it in small <laughs> steps like contributing talks to open science forums um, publicly making your trainings available and all these small steps um, that that's a first point to start yeah I'm not sure if that yeah. Yeah, it does the question yeah. I, I, I want to um, kind of um, go um, I, I resonate with that. Um, you don't have to develop an R package or be yeah. an R core member. You can um, you can do teaching in small mm -hmm. ways. You can mentor someone, um, for example. You can present um, you can present your work. You can write blog posts. You and I also don't think you have to do this your whole life. Like you can have <laughs> like a, a moment between I don't know twenty five and thirty where you organize maybe co organize a conference where you maybe help a local um, you, um, R user group community, and then you pass the torch on to somebody else. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah but I think um, one point uh, I, I is probably not mistaken for the real core, even the base packages. Yeah. I, I know example, uh, not the base packages, but the recommended packages. There are critical cases of where is the successor to maintain it yeah. mm -hmm. when the yeah. original one goes in retirement or simply doesn't have any intention. To a certain degree, I think, like um, the ETH uh, did, I believe Genentech did uh, a similar thing uh, with... Uh, uh, but it is maybe something we have to sell to management. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, also to a certain degree, uh, it is all ad advertisement in a certain way. People, um, particular graduates from, uh, from, from university, like when there is some support for open source uh, work that is like a publication. Yeah. And when you're a scientist, publications is your dopamine. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's now a different dopamine. Okay. So, so I'd, I'd like to, to add at another angle and that of the illusion of effort. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about contributing, let's say, 20% of your time to open source development, I know, for example, Will Landau of, I think, Eli Lilly has this time to develop his <laughs> pipeline manager, what it's called, Drake, Targets. No, it's all of them. Yeah, so <laughs> so <laughs> the effort is amazing. It's gargantuan. And still he manages to pull this off over a continuous period of time. I don't know how he does this, given that he also has a day job that's probably 80% on paper and 120% in reality. So this dilution of effort, so does it get you uh, development built up from the ground where when we compare this to what Posit has been doing for, for, for a long time, they actually hired full-time engineer to work exclusively on open source building Arling vectors deployer type. You you see this this stack and they sell the product for 
a thousand per person per year, that's fine. Half of this goes back to open source. This is their model. This kind of seems to work, although I'm really troubled by the recent developments. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, so I don't know, Romain, would, 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 would you like to share your perspective on how it is to work full time on open source? Do you still get the dopamine? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> not to put me on the spot, all right. I'm trying not to be emotional about what you just said. <laughs> um, so I'll just reflect on the beginning of what you said and not the personal bit of uh, the layoffs and stuff. Um, I think that the model is um, a good way to bring talent talented people to contribute a lot of their time to develop open source software because if you if you don't have any sort of model to allow those people to spend their time doing that then they are not i mean at the end of the day if i'm going to spend 100 um, percent of my time working on open source then i can't transfer that dopamine to my uh, Bank, account. bank to pay the mortgage mm -hmm. and stuff, you know. So, <laughs> you know, as as <laughs> as much as money isn't, uh, you know, an end game, you still need some of it, right? <laughs> so, um, but I, yeah. Models such as the ones that Posit have um, developed do seem to work. And uh, you know, uh, seem to be a good balance between um, you know bringing new and and good tools to the community um, and fund those tools with uh, commercial products. That 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 seem that seem to work, but it's not necessarily the only model. The yeah. the the other. Some other companies do um, sell support and training right. and things, and that is also, uh, you know, a good approach. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Question here. <coughs> so I think um, for us here at Roche, um, we also recognize the strategic advantage um, of having the open source software um, kind of as a standardized environment um, for regulatory submissions. And I think if companies recognize that it's not only for attracting talent, but that it's also actually tied to the business objectives, um, then we can um, make those um, key points to management um, and um, yeah, support the community at the same time. Um, we have approximately a couple of minutes le le left. I, I promised the chat GPT question, so we'll get there quickly <laughs> and hopefully end on a high or a low. Um, so maybe I start with Muriel and we'll go down the, the, the panelists. Um, how do you see um, the advent of large language models like chat GPT and how do you think that might impact, say, the R community, our development, and essentially just open source development overall? Do you think it'll be a good thing, bad thing? Any thoughts? <laughs> An interesting thing. <laughs> um, for me, it's too early to make any predictions about it. I have used it. I was not always satisfied with the result for my programming. Um, but instead of going to Stack Overflow, it surely is a speeds up um, finding the results that I need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Passing it on. Try not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a pragmatic view and <laughs> definitely see what it can do and uh, what it is. Whether it's now, uh, it has been hyped as the fourth big technological uh, step. I'm not yet convinced about that. Maybe it's a fad that fades away over time. My personal thinking is if they can get into this um, causal model development, that will be powerful. Yeah, I, I see it more from a yeah from a learning perspective. 
I, I don't think it's like good or bad. It's good something <laughs> anyway. So, <laughs> um, um, but I I think it will just maybe make it easier to to not do the boring bits. Um, that uh, yeah, that kind of setting up scripts or like setting mm. up an exploratory analysis, like all these things. I think from a uh, like automated um, data analysis point of view, uh, it's it's probably interesting. And then also from just learning because uh, like there is a much younger generation to come and they don't Google anymore. I think <laughs> like they they will use other tools. And I think um, this is probably yeah an opportunity also to have maybe the other R code or yeah. <laughs> and just to close up with a keynote, Kiro, do you yeah. have any thoughts about language models? I'm not sure. Will will we get? Um, Deprecated at at some point as a, as a species, <laughs> 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 when does sentience begin? That that's I, what yeah. what um, troubles me a bit. Yeah. But uh, the 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 R questions I I had to ChatGPT, except of uh, about the DM package. This was a weak point, but it's a small one. Um, were answered with a surprising accuracy, even what I didn't think complex data transformation things like um, I have a table of transactions and get me a, a table that represents a ledger, ChatGPT could do this, I was amazed. So mm -hmm. really, well, exciting and also anxious about <laughs> what's, what's, what's there to come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we are running over time. I don't, James, do we have time for one? Should we, does the audience want to come back on ChatGPT? Any thoughts, particularly around uh, our community? <laughs> Any thoughts? Again, I, I guess we can close anxiety, but also maybe some enthusiasm as well. So I want to thank the panelists and Kiro for a really exciting engagement discussion. Also to the audience as well. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the first session. We'll have about a five minute break. We're a little bit five minutes um, late and then we'll have the parallel sessions here. So we have a session in the main room and a, a, a session in the smaller auditorium as well. So can you give it up to the panelists and Kirill as well? Thank you. Everyone.